Thank you. I presume you can all hear me. Um, so this is kind of an iconic image that happened 100 years ago. Um, it's this image of the um, destroyed city hall. It comes from the Museum of the City of San Francisco. In that earthquake, uh, which is now um, just over 100 years ago, uh, it was about a 7.9, 8.0 earthquake. Uh, about 3,000 persons uh, died or more. Um, it was thought at the time that only about 500 or 700 persons died, but that actually was a, um, <coughs> a, uh, an interesting um, public relations ploy, really, to, to try and um, reconstruct the image of San Francisco in the aftermath of the earthquake to convince folks that it really wasn't as, as, uh, as damaging as it was. Uh, today, if this were to occur, it would probably be at least a half trillion dollar event and maybe more than that. Um, the numbers are, uh, are not well known. <coughs> it actually happened on a fault which, um, just to give you an idea, which uh, was about uh, 400 kilometers long from San Juan Batista up uh, past Shelter Cove and to Point, uh, Point Arena and Cape Mendocino to the north. And uh, the offsets were as much as uh, something on the order of 25 feet or several meters. Uh, this is kind of interesting. It was uh, taken on a, um, a farm uh, in, on the peninsula. The farm uh, was owned by a farmer by the name of Strain actually, and his uh, fence was offset by about two meters. So you can see there actually are many scales of length in earthquakes all the way from the centimeters of the thickness of the fault zone to the meters of offset to the hundreds of kilometers of fault length. There's a number of images of these, uh, starting with a famous Arnold Genth image uh, showing the burning of the city and the destruction of the city. I'm sure you've all read about this. This is the financial district um, with the anniversary last spring of the, uh, of the, uh, of the event. Uh, many of these were in the press. Uh, San Francisco recovered over the intervening uh, 10 to 20 years, and uh, there were many of the problems that one saw then that one now sees uh, with the recovery from Hurricane Katrina. With Katrina, uh, Swiss Re, actually, Swiss Re Insurance Corporation estimated that there were at least $80 billion in insured losses. And in fact, <clears throat> if you go back and look at the history of the financial um, um, aspects of disasters like this, something on the order of several decades ago, uh, insurance companies basically supplied all the risk capital for the recovery from disasters. Um, then uh, over a period of time, uh, it was realized they were undercapitalized, so the reinsurance industry sprang up. And now actually what's happening is as a result of Hurricane Katrina, uh, many of the losses are now being transferred to the financial markets through a variety of innovative financial vehicles. And these things are called catastrophe bonds, sidecars, uh, mortality risk insurance. Basically, they're called insurance-linked securities. And the current market estimated by Swiss Re just a few weeks ago in an article by Bloomberg News was something on the order of $35 billion in these um, various kinds of financial instruments probably rising to 350 or more billion dollars uh, within 10 years and uh, into the trillions of dollars and possibly as large as the uh, mortgage bond market, which is $6 trillion. So around the world, more and more, there's a realization that the traditional institutions really can't deal with disasters like this, that in fact you need to have innovative um, financial arrangements in order to uh, improve the recovery aspects. Well, as you know, it's been said in the press many times, um, with the demise of, uh, so, to, so to speak, of New Orleans in the, in the hurricane, the, uh, the most at-risk portion of, of, of the country for flooding now is Sacramento. And so we're acutely aware of that. We actually have to be, sit on high ground of about 50 feet. Uh, my house is at 38 feet, and the, uh, the levees, I think the tops of the levees in the area are about 33 feet. So at least at my house, we feel like we're uh, we're five feet above the problem, but uh, nonetheless, everybody's pretty much aware of this. The last uh, flooding in this area of significance was in 1997. This was in the Natomas Basin area, which is to the north and west of Sacramento. And as you probably, if you've been there recently, you know that there's thousands of homes in that area that was flooded as recently as 1997. So the pocket area also, which is um, down to the south of Sacramento, um, is likely to have, uh, if a levee breaks, as much as 20 feet of water in it. <coughs> so. These things are, are, are uh, extremely dramatic and important. The flip side of this is the droughts that we've had. Um, there have been many periods of droughts uh, in, in California's history. 
Uh, 87 to 92 was a period of, of, of drought or a dry period in the event. And as our population grows and as there, there's more and more pressure to um, bring states like uh, areas like the Hetch Hetchy uh, area back to their natural pristine state, there is some uh, pressure to uh, remove uh, some of these dams that exist, uh, which would exacerbate problems with water supply. Wildfires are another aspect of drought uh, problems. These are images uh, from um, uh, NASA uh, space satellites. Uh, the weekend of October 25th, 2003, massive wildfires in Southern California area, Santa Ana winds and so forth. So we have a number of these different types of things. Um, also volcanic eruptions in California, we're just lucky we have all of this stuff. Uh, so it's something that we really need to uh, deal with in major ways. And, and we do, uh, we, in the past, we've dealt with them in a sort of one-off kind of um, off-the-cuff kind of way. I think much of this was, uh, the, the potential was brought home uh, to us uh, with the confluence of Hurricane Katrina and the tsunami on Boxing Day, December 26, 2004, in which more than 230,000 folks lost their lives in Indonesia. Um, this is an image, actually, of a, of a model, a tsunami, a simulation of a model, together with some data that was taken by a satellite uh, that happened across the track of the tsunami as it was moving across the Pacific, or the Indian Ocean, excuse me. And you can actually see that the level of water uh, in, these, in these waves in the Indian Ocean was on the order of a few tens of centimeters out in the open ocean. But when you get to land, there's a nonlinear effect of the wave uh, increasing in amplitude dramatically, and that's why you got uh, tsunamis with heights of tens of meters. <clears throat> before, um, you can see these before and after pictures of the same area in the Aceh region of Indonesia. Um, Tsunamis can happen uh, in many parts of the world. Again, this is Indonesia, uh, data from Digital Globe or images from Digital Globe. Post, uh, pre and post other examples. Uh, this is uh, pre and this is post inundation. So you can see uh, much of the, uh, the coastal land area there was uh, sig significantly altered by these, by the tsunami and its, uh, its after effects. <clears throat> so all of these types of things are um, of great interest to those of us who study tsunamis because, uh, and, and earthquakes because what we would like to do is understand them uh, and, uh, and, uh, and adopt uh, procedures to mitigate them. In the, in the Pacific Ocean, uh, there are a network of several buoys that warn us of potential tsunamis, but in the Indian Ocean, uh, NOAA does not maintain such, uh, or did not maintain such buoys. Uh, so there was really no way for, at that time, for the um, Indonesian area to, uh, to be warned in advance of, uh, of uh, the tsunami, the possibility of the tsunami occurring. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with uh, the Cascadia subduction zone. Uh, just to our north, up off the Pacific Northwest, um, we have a, um, an example of plate tectonics in action there, just as we do with the San Andreas Fault. Only in this case, one has one of these crustal plates diving down underneath um, the North American continent. And as a result, one actually has very large earthquakes on this interface. Now, in the recent past, in the past 10 to 15 years, there have actually been a series of, I guess I should use this, there have been a series of slow, what's, what are called slow earthquakes. So you'll see a period of time where um, <clears throat> there is a sudden slip event occurring. Uh, these things happen. This is the offset here. And then there is strain accumulation and so forth. So there is stress-dependent non-seismic slip that actually occurs. Uh, that's similar to uh, other types of slip that occur around the world. Uh, so one has, at the same time as a slip is occurring, bursts of uh, activity uh, by which one can track this. And we don't actually know at this point whether this is a precursor to a large event that's about to occur or whether this is a normal type of behavior of this system because, in fact, uh, we haven't had data of this accuracy in this area um, until very recently. One of the reasons why we should be concerned about that is because, interestingly enough, it's known that um, on January 26, 1700 AD, there was a magnitude 9 earthquake in this region, the same size basically as the Sumatra earthquake. Uh, it inundated uh, the coast of um, drowned forests and whatnot, inundated the coast of Washington, and actually uh, caused a tsunami of about 3 meters height in Japan, which is how one of the reasons this is known. It can be dated so precisely. The tsunami occurred between 9 and 10 p.m. on the evening of January the 26th, 1700 A.D. Uh, and um, as I said, there are drowned forests along the Washington and Oregon coast, and there were uh, records, written records of the time, uh, 
kept uh, by Japanese uh, people um, who uh, noted that the tsunami existed. So if you work all this out, uh, people like Kenji Sataki in Japan came to the conclusion that um, indeed there was such a tsunami and that it was very similar to what happened in the same size really as what happened in Sumatra. So we in California are certainly at risk of tsunamis, not only from that area, but from other places around the Pacific Rim. <coughs> Um, with respect to our state and our university campuses and so forth, I think what happened in the Hurricane Katrina episode was a wake-up call. Uh, the universities down there were severely affected. Um, there was some advanced preparation. Um, Tulane did well compared to other institutions. But the campus closed for a semester. Uh, losses included hundreds of millions of dollars in property damage. Think about all of your research assets that you have here uh, should an earthquake occur on the Hayward Fault, as it did in 1868, just up the hill here. Um, there are collections and, and other kinds of data. There are, of course, students. Uh, that's a lot of you. Uh, operating costs, there's staff, and so forth. It's, it's actually almost certain that one of our campuses in the UC system uh, will be closed by an earthquake in the next uh, several decades. Uh, and then the question is, what do we do about that? What do we do with the faculty? with the students, with the staff, with the research, and so forth. So um, <clears throat> there are simulations of uh, how this might affect. This is the Terror Shake simulation carried out by people at uh, UC San Diego in collaboration with scientists at the uh, Southern California Earthquake Center. We also uh, worry about our sort of sister campuses at the California State Universities and how they will fare in uh, similar kinds of disasters. <clears throat> So natural hazards cause great destruction. Not only, I mentioned the Sumatra earthquake, not only that, but also uh, the Pakistan earthquake, which occurred in October of 2005, killed at least 80,000 persons. Um, they've still not recovered any sense from that. Hurricane Katrina, that we just had a discussion about an hour ago uh, of um, people going down there and seeing the bathtub ring in the poorer sections of the city. Um, and seeing the devastation that still exists down there. And uh, of course, there are questions about how they will recover, when they will recover. Um, as you may know, uh, there are examples like State Farm Insurance Company, which has stopped writing property insurance policies in the state of Mississippi. Um, there have been problems in um, Louisiana with insurance companies um, not being willing to um, to uh, refund homeowners uh, for their policy losses. Um, there are in reinterpretations of policies. Uh, flooding is generally not covered by some of these policies, but wind damage is. So the question is, was the damage caused by the wind or was the damage caused by the flooding? And of course, the insurance companies tend to take the more <coughs> lenient view for their own uh, personal cases. Of course, one of the reasons they do that is because with the size of these payouts, uh, their credit ratings are affected. And so they're not able to float bonds as attractively. Their stock becomes less, becomes worth less, and so forth. So they have, they're actually motivated uh, by a number of factors to begin to find other sources of capital to um, address their policyholders. <clears throat> So there are actually many different ways of coping with disasters, and I, I sort of arbitrarily divided them up into four stages. Anticipation, which involves advances in forecasting and hazard characterization. There's actually an industry of companies in the Bay Area and elsewhere that deal with this, such as Risk Management Associates, AIR Worldwide, Equicat, and some others like that, that actually make a, a, um, a business out of uh, developing loss models, economic loss models, and so forth. Um, improvements in public health and safety and infrastructure uh, also goes under the name of anticipation. In mitigation, engineering, the built and the social environments so they are robust, so that they are not uh, as affected by the sudden extreme events that occur. Uh, training and public awareness. This is, of course, uh, uh, a result of uh, one of the things one can do is hold simulation exercises. Golden Guardian is an example of that that's held in the, in the state frequently. Uh, response, search and rescue, mobilizing emergency services. This is always a problem. Uh, how do you get the, uh, how do you first of all find out where the most damage is, where the people are injured and get the resources there? How do you get people out of that region into safe areas? Uh, at UC Davis, we tend to think, or in the Davis Sacramento area, we, we tend to think we're relatively immune from earthquake problems, but, and that's probably true from the direct effect, but what is likely to happen is that following a major earthquake, there will be uh, hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of folks uh, traveling up I-80 trying to get 
out of the area that would be affected down there, and that will certainly affect us uh, to a considerable degree. In fact, I've heard stories about how um, hospital directors um, after Katrina uh, were actually standing guard in their parking lots with uh, shotguns trying to keep people from getting off of buses in areas that were not too far removed from Louisiana or from New Orleans uh, so, uh, and, and trying to get them farther out so that they would not sort of clog up the whole system right there. Um, recovery, rebuilding and restoration, that's a major issue with New Orleans, of course. It's uh, a year and a half, two years later, and um, many of these issues are festering there um, to a, a considerable degree. Financial and economic resources are not available to, to cope with that. Well, about a year ago, a number of us around the system started meeting and talking about this following Katrina, and um, we felt that collectively that there needed to be some kind of system-wide effort uh, devoted to this task. You've got the state agencies on the one hand and the legislatures who are trying to cope with these problems and they don't have the kind of information they should need uh, that they do need to, in order to cope with that. So the UC system, of course, is, uh, can be regarded as some kind of a think tank uh, with this world-class research expertise and why aren't we, you know, why shouldn't we be in closer contact with these folks so that there can be a better exchange of expertise information and resources. So we thought that a partnership with the appropriate state agencies as well as industrial commercial partners and so forth should be established. <clears throat> and that is really the origin of the idea of the California Institute for Hazards Research. So our motivations are really um, involved with coping with natural hazards and those disasters, the corresponding disasters that the hazards induce. Um, and we actually have a number of advantages these days that weren't apparent 100 years ago uh, in information technology, which I'll touch on a little more, bit more depth in a moment, uh, with simulations, bandwidth, and all this kind of thing. Um, information uh, is, is much more widely available just in the last 10 years because of um, entities like Google and uh, Google Earth and uh, other such uh, tools, uh, web-based tools. Um, <clears throat> We need to have uh, industrial government partnerships uh, that will help us develop this technology. Uh, and uh, the state government is uh, also charged with employing the best uh, types of research and transforming it into useful policy. And the UC also, uh, we have a responsibility to the people around the state who pay our salaries to, to use our, uh, our knowledge and our research in the benefit of society <clears throat> through a variety of different mechanisms which involve um, you know, computation, information technology, which is, of course, the main theme of Citrus. The new technologies that um, are particularly interesting are remote sensing, uh, and I'll give some examples later of synthetic aperture radar interferometry, which is a new type of uh, satellite-based tool that uh, holds great promise for California and elsewhere in the um, pursuit of, um, of, uh, of data and that, that bears on hazards of various kinds. Um, NASA will launch uh, probably with a satellite by 2012. Uh, there have been some satellites that have been launched uh, to date, which is how we know about this technology and its usefulness. Uh, and there are various ways that the data can be, need to be curated, searched, analyzed, and visualized. And in fact, interestingly enough, Google is playing a major role in developing data curation services for NASA. Um, sensor webs and smart, cheap sensors. Um, you know, these are, it's been suggested these could be poured into concrete and embedded in walls and other kinds of structures to provide readouts uh, with RFID technology on the state of health of buildings <laughs> and so forth. This is a, something that needs to, re to really be uh, employed uh, much more uh, substantially. Computational simulations uh, allow us to do things we couldn't do 100 years ago, obviously. We can actually model and simulate these hazards and their effects on society. <clears throat> and we can actually hopefully learn to forecast these events as well. So we actually have all of these different things. Um, we've, we've thought about, um, I'll talk a little bit later about this uh, partnership that we're developing with Google. Um, it was one of the interesting aspects of that was Google asked us, uh, you know, are we just a, interested in California hazards or were we interested in worldwide hazards? And our name is somewhat deliber deliberately ambiguous. Uh, we are an institute, we could be called an institute in California or we, we could be called an institute that works on California hazards. We tried to make it ambiguous enough so that it, it covered both possibilities, but obviously most of us are interested in hazards worldwide and not just in California. <clears throat> There's also the issue of uh, human-induced disasters, i.e. terrorism is one that we haven't included in here, 
Uh, some people have asked us if we are interested in that as well. Um, interestingly, the risk management companies that I talked about earlier uh, are interested or have developed, extended their models to include terrorism. Uh, we haven't really thought much about that at the present time. We're just getting off the ground, and that seems like an area that um, is interesting, and it has certain features in common with these other things, but um, is not necessarily um, something that we think we're competent at the moment to address. So we view hazards as, as examples of complex systems for which there needs to be forecasting, risk assessment, mitigation, all these things, uh, studies of all these different things. We feel like we should be concerned more with the research aspects of this rather than the policy aspects, and we would leave the policy aspects to the state and to the appropriate bodies that do that. Uh, information technology in particular, uh, simulations, design, analysis, high-performance computing, Citrus, and so forth, distance collaboration, difference learning. One of the things I haven't mentioned is education. Um, there is a need to train the next generation of hazard uh, scientists and engineers and medical people, uh, as well as um, public education, as well as um, folks who do emergency response and so forth. <clears throat> well, Citrus is you. Um, this is one of the major aspects uh, headquartered here at UC Berkeley that um, deals with uh, information technology. <clears throat> Don't need to belabor that. The Center for Catastrophic Risk Management is also here. This is a group of folks in the um, um, social science, economics, engineering space that are very interested in um, dealing with um, hazards and they have uh, interacted extensively with folks in the New Orleans region following the hurricane. And the Berkeley Seismological Laboratory, which has been here probably since the 30s or 40s, uh, I don't remember exactly when it started, but they've been interested in earthquakes for a long time and they work closely with the state and with the federal government and with other folks on campus to define the earthquake hazard. Cal IT2 is another one of the institutes, obviously, down in San Diego, uh, which uh, is interested in a variety of different um, applications to disasters. Here's one, wireless for medical response, uh, so wireless internet information systems. I'll talk a little bit more about this uh, in the next few slides with some other partners who are interested in similar kinds of things as well. The idea here is that um, uh, this one was wireless internet. Um, basically, what is uh, what thing, this is sort of morphing into these days is um, uh, mobile phones uh, using the web-based capabilities of mobile phones for disaster information in real time. Uh, the National Energy Research uh, Computer Center uh, up the hill here, or actually, I guess the uh, machines are actually in Oakland somewhere now. I think. Um, anyway, this is a. A pool of, uh, of supercomputing uh, resources, uh, CPUs and cycles that can be used and have been used for a variety of different applications in the simulation space and in the uh, potentially control space as well, data storage and whatnot. Uh, at UC Davis, we actually have a, um, a um, reciprocal relationship of, uh, for backing up our respective systems with UC Berkeley. So that in effect, um, <clears throat> some critical data such as administrative data, administrative computing data is backed up from UC Berkeley, is backed up at UC Davis and, and vice versa, the assumption being that both of these centers won't be taken out uh, by the same hazard, although uh, I guess it's conceivable that that could happen in some cases. So one of those, one of the areas of concern really is um, how do we, how do the campuses protect ourselves and our, our research endeavors and our, our, our intellectual property, if you will, uh, from uh, destruction in such a hazard. So San Diego Supercomputing Center is one of the world leaders in, uh, in IT, as you know, and it's focused on a variety of computational services, and it's an international resource, and again, it's, uh, many of us have used it for simulations of a variety of different things. Over at the President's Office in Oakland, um, there is a project called UC Grid that you probably know about. The idea here is that um, this actually grew out of the concern that there are high-performance computing needs uh, that are met uh, more and more these days with uh, clusters, uh, compute clusters, rather than with supercomputer centers. So 
These days, scientists, engineers, people tend to uh, buy their own uh, supercomputer, so to speak, which is a parallel supercluster in construction. So it involves um, CPUs. Typically, one uses quad-core AMD Opteron systems right now with uh, InfiniPath or InfiniBand interconnects. These are actually as fast as um, the machines that you see in supercomputer centers, typically. Uh, but they're much cheaper. Um, they do, they are, they're well suited to um, relatively loosely coupled problems, but not quite so well suited to really tightly coupled problems where you need really low latency and fast interconnect speeds. Well, anyway, with the growth of these things, um, people have begun to use their startups, faculty have begun to use their startups to buy these, these compute clusters. And it became, when I went to UC Davis, uh, that's what I did, and it became rapidly clear, like within an hour, that there was no place to put this cluster. Um, the data centers had long ago been converted away from, you know, IBM 360 big iron machines to housing trash and potted plants and so forth and so on. And the electrical systems had been allowed to sort of decay and the air conditioning systems were nowhere up to capacity to cool these high density systems. And uh, as we traveled around the system and talked to other folks, uh, it became apparent that other campuses had the same problem. So, now we have this burgeoning resource of superclusters on these campuses that are tucked away in closets and in buildings and the power goes out. We've had this issue at UC Davis quite frequently recently where we'll have power outages and you, know, you lose all your runs and your data for that day or what have you and so forth. So the problem here is um, can we do something a little bit better by looking at this as the whole system? And that's what UCOP is concerned with. Can we um, basically build a grid in which the unused CPU cycles from all these superclusters are sort of collected together and are made available to others? Maybe we can do things in a more cost-effective way. And also can we move these clusters off campus and into cooled and powered warehouses somewhere else <clears throat> that aren't so expensive? So um, the other, and the other point, of course, is this issue about um, disasters and hazards and the need for backups of these systems. Uh, currently, uh, many of these clusters, these compute clusters, are not backed up at all by anything. So if they go down the tubes, uh, you know, everything goes down the tubes, and that's really not the way you want to you wanna do that. <clears throat> Uh, so this UC grid idea has some benefits. Uh, it provides an extensible and scalable architecture. Uh, it can be certificated. Um, one of the other problems is security, of course. Um, you don't want any, just anybody walking into your compute center saying they're going to work on their cluster and wind up, you know, messing things up for other people. Um, <clears throat> you want the solution to be robust. Uh, you want it to be locally managed, uh, virtually available, and you want to locate resources where they make sense to locate them. So this vision goes something like this. There are these systems around the UC uh, compute systems around the UC campuses. <clears throat> they have backups in a couple of several different places. Uh, they have images, uh, they have replicated data and so forth. And we're all happy because uh, if something goes down due to an earthquake at Berkeley or an earthquake at UCLA or something like that, um, we'll all, be, uh, all your data will be intact. <clears throat> well, I mentioned partners. Um, we made contact through some folks uh, with um, a group at Google, and uh, there was a great deal of interest expressed by Google. Um, they have a number of different um, groups in Google that uh, are actually very interested and worked with the folks at Hurricane Katrina. They're sort of headquartered, uh, I would say the most prominent organization is this one called Google.org. When Google.com was set up by Page and Bryn uh, in 96, Six or 97, I guess it was, they reserved 1% of the stock for Google.org, which was their philanthropic arm. And <clears throat> as Google has grown, this has become more and more of an interesting focus for Google. Uh, Larry Brilliant was hired, he's a director, to head this thing up. He is a medical doctor who's interested in infectious disease. And actually, it was his idea to track the spread of infectious disease by its signatures or its mirrors that, that, are, that pop up on the internet. So it's kind of an interesting idea. Uh, the original foci were public health, climate change, and poverty alleviation, but it's been expanded to include all kinds of disasters and hazard response around the world. There is a Google disaster response team that is a group of individuals at Google who uh, get funding to go to places like Katrina and help out, or New Orleans, and help out as best they can. 
There is the Google Earth Outreach Team, which is trying to help various humanitarian groups better visualize their data. Uh, it's kind of a GIS uh, type operation using uh, Google Earth, uh, and they especially like to, um, to have content uh, that is provided uh, through Google Earth. And then there's a separate group called INSTEAD, and I, to be honest with you, I don't remember what INSTEAD stands for. It's an acronym. You can look it up on the web. It's uh, an NGO, non-government organization, and it's kind of a federation of disaster relief experts. It's under the presidency of a fellow by the name of Peter Carpenter. Now, Peter is a disarmingly, um, uh, a disarmingly interesting fellow. Uh, when I met him uh, he recently, he said that he introduced himself by saying he was the fire chief of Menlo Park. Well, he's a lot more than that. He, I looked him up on the web, and he's actually a... Um, First of all, he's on the board of directors of the School of Public Health here at UC Berkeley. He was the executive director of the Stanford Medical Center. Uh, he was the um, president of Alza Development Corporation, which is a subsidiary of Alza Pharmaceuticals, a major pharmaceutical corporation. And he was, I, I gather, one of the, uh, he has CLL, chronic lymphocytic leukemia, I think. So he's, he was one of the survivors of Vietnam, Agent Orange, et cetera, et cetera. And he's done major work in promoting visibility of people with that, those issues. But he's a really inspiring fellow and um, really down to earth. Um, so they have these projects or they have these criteria um, that meet several number of needs. Um, instead, has been adopted by Google, although they are not formally part of Google, uh, and I think they receive partial funding from, from Google as well as funding from elsewhere. So they address important needs in disaster preparedness. They tend to be more in the, in the space of disaster response, um, sort of short-term type things, although they are interested in all aspects of it. So they want uh, projects to serve as models of disaster preparedness and awareness that don't duplicate known efforts, that don't simply involve you know, giving funding to somebody, but that involve uh, to, to continue doing what they're already doing. Um, and they want to, uh, to build up the credibility of INSTEAD as kind of a local facilitator or a global facilitator of um, um, in the disaster community. <clears throat> so they're really trying to get to have INSTEAD be a focus of major activity in this whole uh, regime, this whole space. Another partner, set of partners that we are talking with actively is the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena and the NASA Ames Research Center. As you know, NASA Ames has a UC connection. Uh, JPL does not. It's managed by Caltech. Although JPL does have uh, itself, it has strategic partners uh, such as UCLA and uh, other universities in the Southern California region. Uh, JPL, uh, of course, is, is well known for its expertise in planetary exploration, uh, as well as its expertise in, expertise in uh, communications, deep space navigation, computation, and so forth. But uh, despite uh, recent uh, statements in Washington in the last year or two, uh, Earth is actually a planet too, and um, uh, apparently uh, we're off to explore Mars, and uh, we don't care much about Earth, but uh, in fact, uh, Earth happens to be the place where we all live, so it's sort of natural to have some focus on Earth. Uh, JPL and, and Ames and NASA have developed many marvelous uh, techniques of instrumentation. Uh, the, I remember very well the advent of GPS. Uh, before that, there was a program of using um, radio telescopes to monitor quasars, and with these radio telescopes, you could get precise positions of the radio of the radio telescopes down to within millimeters, and you could actually track plate tectonics and the motion of the plates with that. Then, when the uh, Navy sent up the Navstar satellites, um, the Navy originally thought that their satellites would just be useful for the military, but of course, these clever engineers found ways to use those. Uh, transmissions from the satellites to provide precise relative locations and the rest is history so we have GPS in every car now and we have networks of GPS stations all over uh, California and around the world and we can get very very precise positions um, that way <coughs> for earthquake type efforts. Now I mentioned uh, synthetic aperture radar interferometry this sort of uh, was brought to the consciousness of the scientific community by an article in Nature uh, that was in 1993. This was a 1992 Landers earthquake. And essentially what this is a result of is the following. Uh, satellites go over regions of the Earth. Uh, this was the ERS-1 satellite at the time, the Earth Resource Satellite 1. Uh, and it shines radio, uh, radar waves down at the uh, 
at the Earth's surface, and uh, there's a very large antenna. It's about 100 meters long, <clears throat> and the antenna can actually synthetically reconstruct an even larger uh, or simulate a larger antenna. And so what you get is if you pass over this region frequently enough uh, several times, uh, you need at least three passes if you don't have any other data, you can then difference the signals, take out the topography, and what's left is the uh, image of the, um, the ground deformation that occurred uh, at the time of the earthquake. So these fringes, these fringe cycles, represent one radar wavelength. So if you count in from the edge of the, of the image in, you can, get, you can actually add up for each one of these fringes. It's 5.7 centimeters is one, um, that's the radar wavelength, so that's one um, fringe cycle. So if you count up the number of these things and multiply by 5.7, you can get the deformation along the line of sight to the spacecraft that occurred at the time of the earthquake. You can actually see down here another bit of uh, another earthquake that occurred, um, fairly small. And there were some other, uh, some other aspects of uh, some other earthquakes like this that were not realized at the time, but were only seen later in these INSAR images. Um, INSAR works by, uh, for example, um, something like this. On the upper left, um, what you see is a simulation or a video of what, how the, uh, the satellite uh, basically works. I mean, this is a little bit fanciful in the sense that it's shown as passing over once and generating one of these INSAR images. Down here actually is a model that was developed uh, at UC Davis, um, and it's a thousand years basically of uh, earthquakes that are shown, uh, represented as INSAR images, and you can sit here and watch this thing. It's kind of fascinating. This gives you the some idea of the uh, grid scale in the image. This is the actual um, model of faults put together. So here we are over in Berkeley, uh, up in here, for example, uh, right there. Um, so this, this type of modeling is what Yvette referred to in the beginning. This is um, a model in which you take um, a model of the Earth and you embed some faults in it and you drive them with some friction and so forth and so on. And what you get is uh, simulations of the history of earthquakes in a region. So you can think of this as rather like a general circulation model of the atmosphere. Um, so in just the same way, you can, uh, you can um, think about uh, forecasting um, the future evolution of earthquakes in the region. Uh, bringing this uh, back uh, closer to home, uh, INSAR can do something like this. It can spot incipient landslides in, the, uh, landslides in the Berkeley Hills right above us here. INSAR is also, this was a paper by Roland Bergman of UC Berkeley, uh, or it's from UC, uh, it's Hilly et al., uh, and Roland Bergman from UC Berkeley was on it. I think Hilly was one of his students. Um, you can actually see the uh, adjusted range rate, or the uh, basically the, um, the uh, incipient slip, or the small amount of slip that's due to each one of these landslides. Um, so um, I don't actually know where the campus is on this map. I guess if we got out the paper and stared at it long enough, we could figure it out. But uh, um, it's um, something to be considered. INSAR is also capable of monitoring volcanoes, so like the Cascade volcanoes, like Lassen that I showed you earlier. Here's an example from Wayne Thatcher at the USGS on um, South Sister, I guess, volcano in Oregon. Um, all the Cascade volcanoes in California are still active. Those go down to into the Owens Valley in eastern California. Uh, INSAR is also valuable for um, things like um, levee subsidence, soil moisture, uh, drought conditions, spotting drought conditions, dried forests and so forth. These all affect the radar reflectivity. So it's kind of a one, one, uh, one size fits all. It's kind of an all-purpose disaster uh, satellite. Well, so let me conclude with the current status of the California Institute for Hazard Research. It's, it's less than a year old. It was established um, in September 2006. Uh, so I've been appointed at least for the MR uh, multi-campus research project phase, which is a three-year phase as a system-wide director. We have six labs and campuses that are members. Being a member just entails sending $10,000 off to UCOP. Um, and others uh, have expressed a desire to join. Um, there are campus-based associate directors for each of these places. Uh, we have organizational issues such as trying to identify some pilot projects, write some proposals. We have a website that's under construction. Um, we have discussions going on with UC State and UC Federal Government Relations people. One of the original ideas here was that we would work together with the state and the federal government on this problem, and there would be an exchange of, on our, on our case, on our, on our side, there would be an exchange of uh, expertise, and on their side, there would be an exchange of uh, resources, let's say, to make that possible. 
We've had several uh, first meetings and workshops. Uh, a number of others are being uh, are under consideration, and we have we've been exploring partnerships with a lot of uh, private uh, agencies and uh, state agencies and private companies, state agencies, and so forth, federal agencies. And these explorations will continue. So we we envision this as being a sort of long-term uh, interest uh, focal point for research in this area in California. So I'll stop there and try to answer any questions you might have. <clears throat> Thank you. I noticed. Uh, it's on. Okay. I, I noticed you were making a distinction between research and um, whatever you call it, politic, politic, policy. 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 And I wonder if which you think was really the missing factor in uh, dealing with Katrina. Uh, that's a good question. That one has been studied to death. Uh, one of the interesting features about Katrina was that. When James Lee Witt was director in the Clinton administration, FEMA was a cabinet level agency. When the Department of Homeland Security was formed, FEMA became part of that. So there is, there's been the statement made that the folks who run FEMA did not, no longer had direct access to the president and therefore could not generate as much attention as the, the people who were interested more in terrorism. So it's likely that there was some politics involved there. It's also been said that um, Many scientists had warned about exactly the scenario that happened in Hurricane Katrina, and the question was, why didn't anybody pay attention to that? Um, I frankly don't know the answer to that question. That's probably a very meaningful question to ask uh, in our context in California. It basically, um, it didn't happen in 1906, really, because people didn't know about the earthquake hazard in 1906. Um, but certainly Diane Feinstein, at a talk I went to last spring at the Centennial, touched on this as well. She was in the stadium, I gather, when the Loma Prieta earthquake happened in 1989, and she remembered that one of her, she was the mayor at the time, and one of her uh, folks had um, actually pointed out to her, not just a few months previous, what would happen if there was a major earthquake in, in, in that region, and basically exactly what he had uh, anticipated did did happen. So uh, her message was pay attention to the scientists. But you know, there's all these problems with budgets and competing voices and and so forth. So hopefully, with this Hazard Institute, we'd like to try and bring some more political leverage to bear on this issue. Do we have any other questions? Okay. Well, thank you, Professor Rundle. Thank you.